Hey there, it's Kevin Kennedy and welcome to day number 16 of Learn Fusion 360 in 30 days. By the end of this tutorial, you'll have a solid understanding of how to manually apply sketch constraints in Fusion 360. Now you may have noticed in the sketch palette, there are a number of different sketch constraints. In this video, I'll explain what constraints are, why you should use them, and I'll walk you through each constraint by demoing what they do. To get started, I'll open up the constraints demo file, and I'll put a link to this demo file in the video description so you can follow along and practice using these constraints. I'll double click on the sketch titled constraints demo located in the sketch folder of the Fusion 360 browser, and double clicking will activate and open up the sketch. Once the sketch is opened up, you'll see the sketch palette dialog box. Then, if you look at the sketch palette, you'll want to make sure that your constraints list is toggled to open. So if I just click on the arrow here, you'll see that it will toggle from open to close. Now before I cover what each constraint does, it's important that you understand what constraints are and why you should be using them. Constraints allow you to relate one sketch entity to another sketch entity. If you look at the sketch constraint icons in the sketch palette, you'll see that the sketch constraints use geometric expressions with the exception of fix slash unfix. Now let's talk about why to use these sketch constraints. These sketch constraints allow you to maintain certain behaviors when the sketch is updated. Constraints help the sketch stay intact, ensuring that elements don't break apart or move to unpredictable areas. So to recap this, you'll want to use sketch constraints to maintain the shape of your sketch so your sketch stays 100% predictable, with emphasis on the 100%, because if you're constraining and dimensioning your sketches correctly, then you should always know what is going to happen when you make a change within the sketch. Now, let's walk through these constraints to show what each one does, starting from the top and working our way down the list. The first constraint we see is coincident, which forces the geometry of two sketch entities to touch. Now to activate any constraint, we'll have to click on it in the sketch palette, and you'll notice it shows it's active by the blue highlight. To add a coincident constraint, we can either select a point or a line. If I select this line first, then you'll see that as I hover over all the other lines, it only shows the points. In this case, points are all that I can use to complete the coincident constraint. I'll select the end of this line, and then you'll see that the lines are joined together. You'll also notice the glyph icon that represents the coincident constraint was added so we know which area is constrained. Now that we've added the coincident constraint, we can drag this horizontal line up or down, and you'll see that the vertical line will always stay connected. The next constraint is collinear, which forces two lines to share a single axis. And they can be at any angle. They don't have to be horizontal or vertical lines. I should also point out that the order in which you select the lines does matter. The first entity you choose will remain in place, and the second entity will satisfy the constraint. If I want the top line to be on the same axis as this other line here, then making sure collinear is active, I can simply click on the first line that will be used as the axis. And then as I click on the second line, you'll see that it moved to the same axis and added the collinear glyph. Now to escape the constraint feature, I can either hit the escape key on my keyboard, select the constraint again, or I can click the selection button in the toolbar. And if I drag one of these lines around, you'll notice that they will now always stay on the same axis. The next constraint is concentric, which forces circular sketch elements such as circles and arcs to share a common center point. So if I wanted to ensure that this circle has the same center point as the arc, I can activate the concentric constraint by clicking on it. Then I'll click on the entities in either order. If I select the arc and then select the circle, you'll see that now both entities share the same center point, which is represented by the concentric glyph. 
I'll hit the escape key to exit the concentric constraint and I'll go ahead and select the midpoint constraint. Now the midpoint constraint, which is represented by a triangle, will come up often as you draw lines in Fusion 360. The midpoint constraint allows us to force the endpoint of a line to the center point of a line or arc. If I select the endpoint of this line and then select the bottom line, you'll see that it snaps to the midpoint and the triangle or midpoint glyph now appears. The next constraint in the sketch palette is fix slash unfix. If I select it and click on a line, you'll notice that it turns green, which denotes that the line is fixed. Notice while the position of the line itself is fixed, the endpoints can still be adjusted. Now personally, I wouldn't recommend using the fix slash unfix very often because if the rest of your sketch is constrained and dimensioned properly, then you should be able to update your sketch while knowing what will happen to your sketch. The problem with fix slash unfix is that if you have a line or multiple lines fixed, then you won't always be able to update them without going ahead and unfixing them first. And sometimes this can get really messy, especially in larger sketches. The next constraint is the parallel constraint, which makes any two lines parallel to each other. I'll click on the parallel constraint to activate it, and then I'll select these two lines. And you'll notice that now if I drag them around, they will always stay parallel to each other. The next constraint I'll click on is the perpendicular constraint. The perpendicular constraint forces two lines to remain at a 90 degree angle to one another. An important thing to note is that the perpendicular constraint does not have to be used on lines that are touching. If I select the left vertical line and then select the top right line, you'll see that it made them perpendicular to each other. You'll also notice that because these two lines were collinear with each other, they are now both perpendicular to the left line, even though only one is directly constrained, as represented by the glyph here. So this is a good example of how constraints can be used in conjunction with one another to constrain sketch entities in a more efficient manner. The next constraint I'll activate is the horizontal slash vertical constraint, which forces a line to snap to either horizontal or vertical, whichever orientation is the closest. If I click on this middle line, you'll see that it snaps to vertical and the glyph appears next to it. Now the horizontal slash vertical constraint can also be used to make points line up with one another. If I select the center point of the circle and then this end point of the line, you'll see that they are now horizontal. And because our arc and circle are concentric, the arc went ahead and moved along with it. Next, I'll activate the tangent constraint, which creates tangency or a curve touching a line segment at a single point. Now tangency is supposed to create a relatively smooth transition. The tangent constraint will create this smooth transition between a line and a circular element for us. I'll go ahead and add tangent constraints to the arc and the nearby lines by selecting the arc and then the right line. Now I'll do the other line by selecting the arc again and then the left line. And you'll see that now we have both of the lines tangent to the arc as represented by the tangent glyphs here. The next constraint I'll activate is the curvature constraint. The curvature constraint makes the curvature at the transition point equal. Essentially, the curvature constraint can help make organic shapes more smooth, so you likely won't be using it very often compared to some of these other constraints. To demo this constraint, I'll have to draw a spline connecting to the arc. I'll select spline from the sketch dropdown menu, and then I'll draw a spline from the edge of the arc to some of these other points. And I'll just drag some of these handles here so it's not as straight. Then to help you see what the curvature constraint does, I'll select the spline and the arc while holding down the shift key, and I'll click the curvature comb in the sketch palette. Now the curvature combs will help you better understand the transition point of the spline and the arc. If we look at where they meet, you'll see that the curvature comb is not continuous because the transition is not smooth and flips to the other side here. 
Now, if I select the curvature constraint and select both sketch entities, you'll see that the comb will change to have a fluid or smooth transition from the arc to the spline. Now, let's get rid of this curvature comb by hitting the escape key to make sure we're not in another command. Then I'll select the arc and the spline, and I'll select the curvature comb icon to turn it off. And I'll hit the escape key once again to clear all commands. The next constraint I'll activate is the equal constraint, which forces two entities to be equal in size. I can select the two horizontal lines at the top, and you'll see that it forces them to be the same size. If I hit the escape key and drag this right point around, you'll see that not only do these two lines stay equal in size, but they will also follow all of the other constraints that we have applied to them. The last constraint I'll activate is the symmetry constraint. The most important thing to note with the symmetry constraint is that it requires three mouse clicks. The first two clicks will be entities that you want to be symmetric, and the third selection will be the entity or line that you want it to be symmetric about. So I'll go ahead and click on this top line and this other line here. And I'll click this line in the middle for the line of symmetry. Now you'll see if I hit the escape key and drag this top line around, both lines will stay symmetric from this middle line. Now before I end this video, I'll show you a few other quick tips. If you right click on any sketch entity, you'll see that it shows all of the available or relevant sketch constraints in the marking menu. Now if I go back and select multiple sketch entities while holding down the shift key, and then right click again, you'll see that the entities that you selected will affect the constraints that are available in the marking menu. Now in this video, I covered how to manually add constraints, but some constraints will automatically be applied while you sketch out entities. For example, if I hit the keyboard letter L for line and draw a line out, you'll see that it will automatically add a horizontal constraint if I let it snap to the grid. So it's important that as you draw different sketch features out, you take notice of what sketch constraints are automatically applied. In day number 17, we'll take a look at how adding dimensions can help us fully constrain our sketches and why fully constraining sketches is an important concept to understand. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions at all about this tutorial or Fusion 360 questions in general, then be sure to comment them below. Hit that thumbs up icon if you learned something in this video and click subscribe followed by that little bell icon to be notified of more Fusion 360 tutorials.